A mother visits her children. But this family get-together is out of the ordinary. Jenny is 40 years old. The people she meets were born in the 1920s. They are the children of a past life. Jenny had been looking for them for decades to exchange memories and visit places of the past. Does her story prove that we really live on Earth more than once? That incarnation and reincarnation are actual realities? Jenny Coquel published her book about the extraordinary search for the children of yesterday in the 1990s. At the turn of the millennium, a movie based on the book was made with Jane Seymour as the main star. But how convincing is this story actually? In order to get a personal impression of this, we travelled to Toaster in England for the first time. There, we were welcomed by a pleasant woman living in humble conditions. Jenny Coquel confirmed in her interview that the search for her children of yesterday started off actually because of her own memories. When she was a child, she was certain that every person would carry such images from the past in them. And over the course of the years, a door to a past life on Earth opened up to her and Jenny felt more and more the urge to find out more about it. Through childhood, I'd always drawn maps and remembered quite a lot of details, and I knew where it was that I wanted to go. I had a school atlas, and the place I was drawn to repeatedly, a point on this map, the only name there was Malahide, and um, I took my little map along the day that this one arrived and laid it down next to the... the um, uh, map from the bookshop and between the two of us we, we realised that the bookshop owner and myself we realised this was the right place so I knew then that it was worth going. Thus Jenny travelled to Ireland and in Malahide it was like coming home for her. She was now certain that the images she carried inside her weren't imaginary but that she had really lived here several decades ago. Soon, in the town, Jenny also managed to find the house she had lived in. However, it didn't look like as she had remembered it. It had deteriorated into a ruin. Time has passed. It was a ruin. When we did find it, it was all covered with brambles. There was only a little bit of wall left. It was um, sort of waist high. Via the former house in Malahide, Jenny made contact with somebody who had known the family she was looking for and slowly the puzzle pieces came together. Jenny herself was named Mary, and now she found out that the surname of the family had been Sutton. Mary Sutton died in the year 1933, at the age of only 35, just after the birth of her eighth child, who had been born here in the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin. Mary had to leave behind her children with her violent and alcoholic husband. The photo shows her daughter Phyllis. She'd had feelings of guilt, but now she finally wanted to find them again, because maybe her children from the past were still alive. Advertised through a newspaper to try to trace the, the members of the family, and I ended up with a... Somebody sent me a tiny little piece of torn envelope with the name and address of one of the sons. So within a very short time, I'd gone from not knowing if I was ever going to find them, not knowing if I was absolutely you know, found the right place, to finding that I'd, I had to face the children. But how could the children believe that their mother had been reborn 21 years after her death? Eventually, Jenny found access to her oldest son, Sonny, with the help of a scholar. And when they were exchanging memories, it became clear that both of them were able to reflect on shared experiences. He'd start on one point 
and I'd be able to finish the story. And then uh, um, I'd start on something else and he was able to finish the story. Uh, I was talking about the, the day in, it must have been something like November, somebody further down the lane had taught the boys how to make a snare to catch game, rabbits and things. And they came rushing in quite early one morning and I remember having wet hands and having to dry my hands and all the children rushed out to have a look at this, this rabbit that they'd caught. It wasn't actually, it was a hare. Um, but I remember the sort of sea of heads and peering down in between everybody's heads and seeing this animal stretched out. But I didn't remember the rest of the, what, what happened after that and Sonny was able to tell me because it was a hare and it was actually very difficult to cook, they let it go. Um, and I thought, so that he, I, I, he, he was able to finish that story. And he was telling me uh, the bread that he liked best was the one that his mother used to make in the saucepan. And I said, oh, you mean the one that just rise up out over the top and just seem, seem to get bigger and bigger? Um, and a couple of times he'd sort of stop and look at me, but we didn't actually discuss reincarnation until quite a bit later. Mm. I, was, I wanted to try and give him uh, a chance to figure out how he felt about what was going on or what he thought it was. But I, he, it turned out he was, um, he was really good actually about it. Because these shared memories felt so natural, it brought them closer to each other. And eventually, mother and son were able to hug each other. What it was, and after a little while, because I saw him a number of times, after a little while he was starting to say, instead of, I remember when my mother did something, he'd turn around to me and say, do you remember when you did something? Which I thought was a, a lovely, subtle, sort of acceptance, because he didn't even realise he was doing it. Sonny, the eldest son, was also the one who made it easier for Jenny to reconnect with his other siblings. Um, we sat round a table, and um, Sonny said, well, what, so what do, you, what do you all think of Jenny's um, story then? And I thought, oh dear, oh dear. Um, because I had been so, trying so hard not to say, look, it is reincarnation, this is how I see it. Um, I've tried to let them have their own points of view, had their own way of looking at it, because they, I wanted them to feel comfortable. I didn't want to impose my view. Jenny Coquel wasn't content enough to have found the children of her former life because, deep inside her, there were more images and patterns of behaviour that had to be categorised. Thus, she continued her research persistently. During our second visit, years later, Jenny told us that in the meantime, she'd been able to match more memories to experiences. On the last life I've managed to research, which is the one I um, have been working on most recently and haven't uh, managed to publish yet, um, I was, I, as a child, I had always remembered or always had this fear of being um, hit by a truck. Um, it was certainly around the age of five or six, I was very bothered. I was a very careful road crosser. And there are other bits that didn't all together uh, gel. That I hadn't added them all up. There's a house that I'd mentioned to people for years. I was looking for this house. I said, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll get to this house. And as it turned out, it was the house in Gateshead that I'd remembered. Um, so the, 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 what motivated me in the end is, as I resolved each life, as I said, another one would become more prominent and I'd have to, have to resolve that as well. But this particular one, yet I remembered the injury. I All my life I've remembered the injury. Um, I, my legs were crushed, part of it. Uh, my legs were crushed and then I didn't remember what happened next. It was um, as a six-year-old mm -hmm. uh, in, in between the um, uh, life as Mary and the life as now. Uh, hypnosis did actually help on that. It helped me remember some of the bits I hadn't remembered. So I got things like um, the road name. Um, under hypnosis I gave a couple of letters that were in the road name, the double L and an E, and it turned out that it was Elliot. Uh, so I got the, the I thought that was, was not bad. I remember where the school was. So eventually on maps, I, mean, I think I took a long time researching that one. I was really bothered. I didn't want to research it while the mother was still alive. 
um, I just thought that was a horrible thing to go back to a mother and say, I remember being the child who, uh, I, just, I just thought it wasn't, uh, so I, I, I did, I put it off for years, but eventually managed to do it and eventually found a family member and I'm still in contact. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's worked out fine. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot easier than it had been in the past because I think I'm much more relaxed about it and um, I was able to talk more easily about it. And... Processing Jenny Cockell's memories led her to an overall picture. The core of the human personality incarnates. It enters, according to the meaning of this word, into the flesh. And this does not happen just once but several times. And it develops because of the reincarnation, regardless of the changes of the body. During the dying process, just the physical body is left behind, a shell. There is a consistency to the core personality. Um, I've been very interested in this because uh, uh, I've been doing quite a lot of family research and looking at genetic links and how much genetics affect your personality. So you can find um, relatives with some similar characteristics. Well, obviously the person who goes from life to life has nothing to do with genetics. It's a different part of you. But I think the person is the person on the inside looking out uh, who doesn't seem to change very much or changes but with slow evolution, in the same way that um, you change from childhood to adulthood, there is still you're still partly the child you were, mm -hmm. even into adulthood. There's quite a, a, a bit of the, the child that you were there. Um, and a life to life, there is that core personality that goes from one to the next. So there, there's probably a very gradual change in that. But the, the amount of overlay that uh, the inherited body brings. Um, I think it's probably the, the amount that, that is brought by DNA is probably quite more considerable than I would like to think. But I think there's probably quite a lot that is, the, the, the jacket that you put on with each life, the physical body has um, physical effects on the way that you present as a person. The experiences that you've ha always had will shape the way that you uh, interact with others same. Um, the amount of tolerance you might have. Uh, you might bring anger from one life to another and find that you don't understand. You might have an emotion that you just don't understand that you might have just brought with you. So yes, life to life, each life is going to affect you every bit as much as things that have happened in your current life. The idea that the actual person incarnates as the soul into the body is very old. Reincarnation is a part of all major religions in the East and was certainly already known in antiquity. In Hinduism, we already find evidence for this in the 8th century BC and a little later in the Occident. The first evidence that can be found is a poem by Pindar in the early 5th century. In philosophy, it's Empedocles, and then Plato in the 4th century, who presents this body of thought quite strongly. He saw it as a pre-existence of humans, as a soul that is set in higher worlds and then literally turns its feathers and thus falls. That's something typical that was taken over by Christianity, incarnation into a body as a punishment. This idea was something that couldn't be eradicated at first. In contrast to religions in the East, the Christian churches reject reincarnation. There is no reference to the thought of a repeated life on earth in order to release oneself from guilt and thus redeem oneself 
in any passed down biblical writings. It would oppose the belief in the salvation by Jesus Christ. But aren't there some text passages that suggest that people knew about the idea of reincarnation at the time of Jesus Christ? Ja, das Volk auf jeden Fall, es war ja, es entsprach ja dem antiken Gedankengut. Es war weit verbreitet. Yes, the people certainly did. It was part of antiquity's body of thought. It was widely spread. For example, the people asked whether John the Baptist was Elijah. They also asked whether Christ was Elijah or Jeremiah or another prophet. Therefore, Christ asked his disciples, who do you think I am? And then there is the famous answer by St. Peter. This is the one thing, and then there is also a direct indication in John 9, where a blind newborn plays a role. There the disciples asked, did he sin or did his parents? Jesus didn't really react to this question, but he accepted it. If the blind newborn had sinned, there must have happened a prehistory. Christ, however, answered to this differently, because it was a lot more important to him to present the greatness of God's works. Does the human soul have a prehistory? Has it already experienced something before birth? If yes, it could offer an answer to an often posed question regarding the righteousness of God. Humans could be responsible for the inequality of births and the various different fates of people themselves. And the Creator wouldn't have to appear as unfair, like in the assumption that souls are completely innocent. Such thoughts were stated in the writings of the outstanding teacher and theologian, Origen, who was born in 184 AD. Today, many critics of the Church and followers of the idea of reincarnation refer to Origen's works. They claim that the teachings of reincarnation were still present in early Christianity and they were discarded in a council in the year 553 AD. Whether Origen actually taught the ideas of reincarnation is controversial. We are certain, however, that he was convinced of a prenatal existence of the human soul. Sein Bild, sein ganz großes Bild, eben, dass wir alle ursprünglich Lichtwesen his big idea was that all of us had originally been light beings and had a home where people who had a near-death experience would refer to as the light. But as I always say, these worlds were sensitive to things that could develop in disharmony. Dinge, die disharmonisch entstehen. And he talked about the abuse of godly order, so that a part of the beings broke away from the godly order to create their own world, their own universe. This universe, or experiment, however, failed, as we put it today. Because this salvation away from the godly order is also a break from the divine origin, and this new world became more and more disharmonic and darker. Oregon talked about sin, and that these worlds removed themselves that far from God that a return wasn't possible anymore. And thus, something became necessary, what we'd refer to as material world. Nur. This means that this material world only developed for the purpose so these fallen beings, if you want to say it this respectfully, but they are actually failed experiments. This always reminds me of this Rysending Cave incident that happened a few years ago. An explorer went very deep into this Rysending Cave near Garmisch-Partkirchen in Germany and had an accident there. 
Und ist unten verunglückt. Ja? Und so somebody had to go deep into the cave as well. Many people were waiting outside for somebody to rescue him. A qualified caver had to go in to rescue him. You can compare that with Jesus Christ, who was the one who went down. But the possibility of a renewed ascent is the creation of the earth. This means that earth itself is this path. The way back to the spiritual world is caused by several reincarnations of these lives on earth. However, Oregon himself might not have taught reincarnation. To him, the pre-existence was clear, meaning that our origins could be drawn back to the worlds of light, and that our self-awareness fell and that we live on Earth in order to be able to learn enough so we will be allowed to return. This means we only know about Oregon, that he taught about the pre-existence of the human soul, but we are not sure he taught about reincarnation. Yes, that's how we need to address it. There are later indications. 300 years later, Oregon was sentenced. Emperor Justinian, who was responsible for his sentence, wrote in his Bill of Indictment, he states that parts of the spiritual world fell into sin and as a punishment they were banished into a body. Depending on the vastness of their sin, they are imprisoned in a body twice, three times, or even more often, and after they have been fully cleansed, they return back to their bodiless state they had before the sins were committed. This church-related research on Oregon of Alexandria bypasses this a little by saying, yes, these were Oregonists, the followers of Oregon 300 years later. They may have certainly taught reincarnation, but Oregon himself may have not. Me personally, I'm convinced that he taught reincarnation. But this cannot be proven historically. Concerning the Church, you can't envision that there was already a completed community with clear dogmas in the 3rd or 4th century. These things slowly developed. We can compare it to a company or a party. The most hard-working theologians, bishops and church fathers prevailed, but they weren't always the most sensitive ones. And thus the doctrines were slowly filtered, in a sense that we have to sharpen our profile. And therefore, several things were eliminated, such as the teachings of reincarnation. But of course, it is highly controversial that it was really representatively enshrined in the church. It is clear that after the Council of Constantinople in the year 553, which banned the teachings of Origen, ideas of reincarnation were not addressed anymore in Christianity. This has remained the case till the present day. The Christian faith is focused on salvation through Jesus Christ, while the big religions of the East emphasize that humans are responsible for their own fate which is caused by the idea of reincarnation. Is it possible to build a bridge between these religious traditions? Certainly, the salvation through Christ's atoning death is the central aspect of the Christian faith. And if somebody shows up and declares that I could also do something myself to atone my sins, that must have appeared as a sacrilege or blasphemy. If you ask for my personal opinion regarding this topic, the counter word that pops up in my head when I think of self-redemption is external redemption. 
and I can't find any indications regarding this topic in the teachings of Christ. This would also contradict the fact that he was busy teaching. Follow my words. Well, here I see a contradiction. On the one hand, he comes to die, and on the other hand, he was teaching very intensely. I would think that people appreciated the love of God very much because of the situation people were in, namely in a very desperate one. And the Savior should lead their way to salvation, and that with their own efforts. Of course, always with the support of the love of God. That's something we shouldn't forget. And therefore, I think Jesus didn't come to be murdered, but to teach. If we focused on Jesus Christ's teachings of brotherly love, and not on his death on the cross, we could join all denominations. Also, the biblical phrase, for what man sows he will reap, seems to be compatible with the ideas of reincarnation. However, the assumption that a soul travels to earth more than once is not just resisted by Christian churches. There have been other reservations. How does the idea that the fate of humans is an outcome of former doings match the idea of free will? What's the sense of reincarnation if most people can't remember their former lives? And doesn't the growing population explosion speak against the idea of a repeated life on Earth? People who agree with the idea of reincarnation don't let themselves be put off by such doubts. The question whether self-inflicted karma and free will can go together can be illustrated with the help of a simple image. Humans are always free to make their own decisions. They can walk to the left or to the right. If they have decided to walk in one direction, they can always choose to go the other way later on. But they have to walk back to the point where they diverged from. This is their self-inflicted fate. Karma and free will don't contradict each other. If reincarnation exists, why is it that most people can't remember their former lives but some, like Jenny Kakel, however, can. If it is not the body, but a non-physical soul that creates the humanly essential core that makes experiences, one could assume that actual memories are not stored in the brain. According to this image, all the experiences are present as a field beyond space and time. When we remember something consciously while we are awake, the physical brain, as long as it's working well, delivers access codes to this field. In order to access memories from other lives on Earth, the brain usually does not offer the matching key. Therefore, they stay hidden to the waking consciousness. Some reincarnation researchers see in this natural oblivion quite a few advantages, a gift of nature, so to speak. It's, it's an awful, I think it's an awful lot to carry with you. Uh, for, to, 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 uh, it, it depends on what's happened. I mean, if there, there are things that sometimes you would be better shutting out and moving away from, they'll still be, the, your reactions will still be there in the unconscious. But um, I think there are, for example, there are, I think there are some forms of therapy where digging up what has happened in this life before you are prepared to look at it can be counterproductive. Um, I think that given time, you will cope with the things that you need to cope with at the pace, as long as you do cope with them when they come up, uh, at the pace that you can manage. Um, but if you're born with uh, a great deal of, I mean, some of the things that have happened to people, you, you just wouldn't want to have to cope with, you wouldn't want to have to remember. I don't think it would be easy to, um, to live a, a, a life uh, uncluttered. A 
According to Jenny Cacao, everybody carries his or her memories inside themselves anyway. Not consciously, but in their personal characteristics and in the skill they bring with them. And thus, they easily develop them in their lives. Well, you don't need to remember, but it's, it's part of your evolution anyway. Mm -hmm. It will still affect you whether you remember it or not. It will still um, temper your character. And I think they, there is an evolution, that get, we, there is the obvious evolution, there is a physical evolution that creatures evolve, they change. But I think there is also an evolution of the soul that you move on and you change and you develop so that um, they would go hand in hand and it will affect societies um, more than even just the individual level. I think this is, this is a good thing because societies move forward with what I see as the change of the soul, the evolution of the soul. Reincarnation shall ensure the development of society. But how does this match up with the constant increase of the world population? With that in mind, can you really assume that always the same human souls incarnate? Even for that, there is a simple image. From the total quantity of people that develop on our planet, there is just a small part that lives in the physical world, while a by far bigger part belongs to a fine matter surrounding the Earth, which hasn't incarnated. Thus, the proportion of the incarnated people grew rapidly in the last 100 years. Is there a causal connection between the outer cultural history and the internal development of the human mind which spans over several incarnations? If yes, it leads to an interesting mental game with numbers. Historians have calculated that during the whole of history to date, roughly 100 billion people have been born. Of these, about 10 billion people were born up to the year 3000 BC. And of these, about 5 billion people were born in historically not exactly construable prehistory. If we assume there are about 5 incarnations per person, there'd be about 1 billion human spirits that have pushed forward the cultural development on Earth from the beginning, and therefore also their own development. But how does this one billion fit into these almost eight billion people who live on Earth today? Is there a pool from which ghosts incarnate that originally don't have anything to do with the natural and cultural history on this planet? Is there something like interstellar planet hopping? Or is actually everything completely different? population explosion doesn't categorically speak against a repeated life on Earth. However, the details might make you think. And of course, this opens doors to many speculations in this field. Some reincarnation researchers believe that personal bonds and karmic interrelations are decisive for every birth. Others think that people can choose their family as freely as they can choose goods from a supermarket. Some spiritual teachers assume that re-embodiment affects everybody. Others think that reincarnation happens as an exception. And again others think that memories of a past life are ultimately not proof of a former incarnation. They think that they access a collective field of memories that is provided by all human beings. It may be possible to get access to this field and thus also to the memories of others. For example, through creative deepening, perhaps. That's, that's 
Verrückte daran ist, dass es äh, entstanden aus dem Holz. Also der Baum, der ist im 13. Jahrhundert gepflanzt. So alt ist das, ne? also aus der Zeit. Wolfgang Beltraki, a painter who became famous as a master forger, is used to stepping back into past times. Namely, by properly going back in time with his consciousness, so that he's able to take over the role of any master and paint like him, and paint new works of art that look like originals. For him, this is a time-traveling experience. Es geht immer erstmal um die Handschrift, die Handschrift des, des Malers, des Künstlers. First, it's always about the style of the painter, the artist. The fact that I can recognize their style, grasp and reproduce them is already a genetic defect. I have painted more than 100 different painters from four or five centuries. That's a huge spectrum. In order to produce creative art, you've got to be good at it. Well, you need a special skill in order to say that you want to paint this or that, and you've actually got to be able to do so. Und man muss das Wissen haben. Das Wissen in dem Fall auch, das kunstgeschichtliche Wissen. And you also need the right knowledge about art history and maybe this subconscious feeling. That's what I do anyway, that I step back in time and deal with the issue. This subconscious feeling seems to be the essential thing to me. You may be able to do research, study literature, but the essential thing is still missing. Ja, das ist bei mir ist es ja so, dass ich auch nachts in diese Zeiten reise in meine Bilder. With me, that's also the case that I time travel at night in my paintings. My wife often wakes me up then because she experiences it as well. I toss and turn and talk a lot. I'm not in deep sleep, but move about in those dreams. And the thing that bugs me the most is the smell. Oftentimes the smell is very bad. The thing I can't take any more at all is the smell of groats. I can't take it anymore. Or shit, if you walk around in 18th century Paris, there's this potent stench of shit. These are actual time travels then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. I move around in my dreams. I smell it, I hear it, I see it. And I'm consciously aware that I'm dreaming, but I'm traveling. It's not that rare. Quite a few people can do that. At least I think so. Stepping back into the fields of the past is part of Wolfgang Beltraki's everyday life. He is aware that everything is stored in the lap of time. I don't believe in transience. I think nothing gets lost. Our body does, that's clear, but mentally I don't think anything gets lost. I think that everything is still there. Namely, always and any time. And that time how we think it is and how we put it together doesn't really exist in this form. Just look out of the window at night and you'll see a star that burned up 100,000 light years ago. So what does it mean, time, those few years here? Nothing. And that's why I'm not afraid of death, because I'm sure that we'll remain in some form. Not in a form of rebirth, I don't believe in any of those things. But that we constantly live in a parallel world, that everything exists again or still. A bit like the Aborigines see this in their dream time. I oftentimes have the feeling that I sit somewhere, but this is not the present. But it's something else. What is real? Right? That we're speaking with each other at the moment? I don't think so.
Is every past, every memory, always present? Does our consciousness decide whether we can enter it? Are memories of reincarnations just contacts to this universal field? What do people who have had a near-death experience and maybe got the chance to have a glimpse of transcendent worlds say about reincarnation? Is it a fact? Für mich, aber da betone ich auch wieder, für mich persönlich ist es eine Gegebenheit. For me, but at this point I like to emphasize that I mean for me personally, it is a condition. But I'm aware myself that we all have our own realities. Every single person has their own reality. That's very important to me, and it is sacred. For me it's like that, that reincarnation is a fact. I already had reviews as a child and teenager now and again. These I didn't evoke myself, but I had moments over and over again where I got a glimpse of former lives. I felt conflicted then because I didn't know that something like this exists. From the church you always heard, Something like this does not exist. This is not good. Because I had my questions, you know. Later it was really nice for me to see that I could view those things consciously. As a child I often got a glimpse, but I couldn't figure out the theme behind it. In the meantime I've been lucky to learn how we can view a situation from the past to take out the essence of it, but to solve it in order to continue our here and now and be strengthened. I only do repatriation if somebody really wishes it, and just when the theme is set further in the past. Most themes that we experience in our lives are current, acute, taken from our history that reaches back to the womb. But there are certain things we can't explain. Oftentimes they're irrational fears. Then it's very interesting to check. Why am I afraid now? So you've recognized the consistency between the themes that touch you now and the glimpses into former lives that you have become aware of. Yeah, sehr wohl. Yes, definitely. I see it as an addition. I've already had so many insights where I realized there is so much in us. We're not as shallow as we think we are. We already bring with us a huge package of experiences when we come here. What I also find interesting, when I pass my own old lives in the review, from which I know of, or from which I get a glimpse of, I can't really see a linear improvement. Also here, time and space are a big secret. I've had lives where I'd been aware that I was way further ahead than now. But I've also had lives in which I'd been completely different. There's a wide range. I've been big, I've been skinny, I've been rich, I've been poor. I've been the predator, I've been the victim. I've been an alcoholic once and then a prohibitionist. I've integrated or connected various experiences that you could have in all those lives. They took place in various periods. Whereas I found out that these periods don't even exist, but that they were taking place simultaneously. If you like, there's just this one present, there's just this one moment. And I'm experiencing me with this consciousness here and now, in this year, in this conversation with you. But simultaneously, all these other realities are taking place as well. It's difficult. You couldn't find a linear development? No, linear definitely not, but very complementary, that for sure. 
I've been a predator, I've been a victim. I've got the feeling that's what it comes to. I can understand a lot better how somebody reacts when I'm aware that I also know the situation very well. What I experienced, for example, was why I had the strong urge to go to Australia. Then I realized that I'd already been there. I also met people that I already knew from before. That's why it was also such a big confirmation that reincarnation does exist. Do you see reincarnation as a possibility for development or as something that affects every person? That's a difficult question. I think about a third of all humankind believe in reincarnation. I think in our latitudes, Christianity is quite widespread. And here people don't really believe in it. Here I'm always very careful what I say. It is, and I want to emphasize that, always my perception. I have made this experience. I have realized that for myself, that we're actually travelers in order to gather experiences. Reincarnation. Stepladder for the personal development or a term for the immersion in the field of memories. Maybe this field is nothing else but the mental inner world with which every human is connected through their thoughts and feelings. And thus, they are more or less always consciously connected to each other through space and time. Es gibt inzwischen sehr konkrete Hinweise. In the meantime, there have been concrete indications that our thoughts and our feelings that we invest within humankind influence other people, influence nature. And this has happened for generations because time does not exist in this field. Everything exists simultaneously. This means that this hard drive is fed with more and more information, which can be accessed again accordingly. And the more irresponsibly we deal with this principle, the worse it's going to be for humankind. With the creed that humankind can create their own fate, the idea of reincarnation encourages the sense of responsibility. It seems to be a base in order to create meaning, which, however, leads out of today's generally accepted materialistic worldview. Incarnation means that something, the soul, the spirit, enters the flesh. Whether once or several times remains a matter of belief. Whatever appears from the field of memories may be fascinating and sometimes healing. Many people are looking for traces and indications of occurrences with which their consciousness may have connected once upon a time. But there is one point on which skeptics and supporters of the idea of reincarnation agree. That in the end, with all the fascination of return and similar mechanisms, it is not primarily about researching the past, but rather arriving at a happy life in the here and now. Mostly, I think you're supposed to forget your past lives. I think you're supposed to be able to forget and live this life. And it's taken me this long. <laughs> to be able to resolve enough of my past lives that I can now feel I can live in the present. It's about time. 